Welcome to the Disney Splat Book, where together we take a journey to explore Disney history from 50 years ago. My name is Nolan. Today, I thought we would start to take a look at Disney's animated feature film, Robin Hood, initially released on November 8th, 1973. Here in part one, we will investigate the inspiration for the making of the film. In this 1973 Disney animated version of the telling of the story of Robin Hood, all of the characters are played by animals. This decision was made by Disney legend art director, screenwriter, and animator Ken Anderson, who had been with the company since 1944, and whose claim to fame was that during a story meeting for Victory for Air Power in 1943, he whipped out his new lighter to light Walt's cigarette, only to realize it was faulty and singed off Walt's mustache. In an article in the official bulletin of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees and Moving Picture Machine Operators, winter 1973-74, Anderson explained about Roman Hood that Disney decided to do what Disney does best use animals for characters. This idea can be traced back to the 1930s, where Walt Disney became interested in the possibilities of basing an animated feature on the 12th century legend of Reynard the Fox and Chanticleer. However, from the Disney point of view, there were obvious problems with the story. It contained violence, and the main character was a crook who defied authority. The antithesis of Disney's moralistic family values. Chanticleer was a 1910 play by Edmund Ross Dand. A satirical commentary on society through the use of anthropomorphic characters. The story hinges upon a vain rooster who believes that the sun rises each morning because it was crowing. <coughs> Initially, Walt was excited about the idea of creating a large barnyard comedy, bursting with gags, and comprised of a cast of cocky roosters and chickens adorned in elaborate feathers, similar to previous cartoons he'd done and would go on to do. Reynard is a group of French, Dutch, and German, 11th century fables, novels, and poems by numerous authors. The most famous is by Goethe, a satire in which cleverness triumphs over physical strength and social power. The fact that the story was in public domain appealed to Walt. Reynard was put into story development in 1937 with Walt assigning writer Al Perkins and Dorothy Blank to create a story development. However, when the treatment was presented in a meeting at the Disney Studios with Wolf, Bill Cottrell, Ben Chomstein, and Otto Langlander on February 12, 1938, it appeared to adhere too closely to the original stories. With Wolf saying, I see some swell possibilities in Raynard, but is it smart to make it? The whole central character is a crook. That's what I'm afraid of. In May 1941, for $5,000, Walt purchased the rights to War Stand's play, Chanticleer, only to discover that Paramount Pictures owned a hot interest in the play, and it was unclear if that also included film rights. But Walt appointed Al Perkins and Ted Sears, the first head of Disney's story department, to see what they could do with the material but they struggled to make an appealing leading character out of the conceited rooster. Walt made the suggestion to combine elements from Reynard the Fox and Chanticleer. Unfortunately, work was shelved on this during World War II. By 1947, three different treatments for the combined stories had been created. Two, by Disney legend, animator, and director Norm Ferguson. Animator Frank Thomas is believed to have said that at one point, three films were under consideration for the next animated feature, Alice in Wonderland, Cinderella, and Reynard. 
Cinderella was chosen with Alice second. However, for the 1950 film release of Treasure Island, Walt had seriously considered incorporating the story of Reynard the Fox, including free animated segments for Long John Silver to tell the cabin boy Jim as more fable. The first would have been Reynard and the Golden Apple, with a mole that things are not always what they seem. The second, how Reynard saved Grimbird's life, suggesting that if the pirates killed Jim, it will make their own death a certainty. And lastly, at the end of the film, when Silver is captured, he retells Reynard's death and confession, indicating that one's wits should always be used for good, not evil. In the end, it was decided to make Treasure Island exclusively live action. Ken Anderson kept the Rainer project alive, creating storyboard sketches in 1956, and in 1960, creating a script loosely based on the legend, portraying Reynard as the villain, not the hero. He and Mark Davis, at Walt's request, attempted to get personality into the characters. Mark Davis recalls, Finally, we were asked to have a meeting on it. So we got into the story room, and we had all the boards up, and had seats for everybody. And then people came in. But the people were all the businessmen, and they were wearing dark wristed suits with neckties and polished shoes, the whole thing. Walt came in maybe five minutes after they came in, and stood way off in the corner. And for Walt Disney, not to take an immediate part up front, that disturbed me. It was unheard of and he stood in the back there. Nobody sat down in the chairs. They all stood up. And this was curious. We had seats for everybody, but they stood there while we sweated blood and tried to tell the story. And finally, at almost the end of telling it, some voice from the back, almost as a kind of signal, said, you can't make a personality out of a chicken. And they all walked out. It killed it. Walt kind of stood over in the corner, rumbled, and finally he walked out and left us looking at one another. That's all it took to kill us, and that was nonsense. We thought we had tremendous possibilities. You can make a character out of a pushpin if you want. We could have brought this off with interesting characters. And they said to Ken Anderson, what the hell happened here? Legend had it that Robin Hood was an outlaw living with his merry men in Sherwood Forest, England. But, did he really exist? In recent historical research, it has come to light that a Robin Hood from Sherwood Forest was in the employ as the valet to King Edward II in 1323. The king visited Nottingham in November of 1323 to investigate the pillaging of deer in Sherwood Forest, which validates the story of the 400 verse 15th century ballad, A Little Guest of Robin Hood. The vision appears as a plowman by William Longlegs, written in 1377, mirrors the rhymes of Robin Hood and alludes to how well they are already known. However, the Robin Hood character is probably set in the reign of King Richard the Lionhearted and during his subsequent takeover by his brother, Prince John, while Richard was off in the First Crusade of 1190. Sherwood Forest in Nottinghamshire, England, once covered an area of about 100,000 acres and was part of the royal hunting ground. It still boasts hundreds of ancient oak trees, one reputed to be over a thousand years old. Robin Hood has been the inspiration of many novels and plays, an operetta and numerous movies, including the silent 1922 classic starring Douglas Fairbanks.
and the Errol Flynn's 1948 version. In fact, in 1952, Disney produced its own version in England. The story of Robin Hood and his Merry Men, starring Richard Todd. And Richard Green played Robin Hood in a TV series in 1955, also made in England. It is interesting to note that in 1953, as part of McCarthyism, an attempt was made in the U.S. to ban Robin Hood. Finally, in October 1968, on a fishing trip with long-term city employee Ken Anderson, Cloud Walker suggested that a classic tale should be the subject of the next animated film, After the Aristocats. Anderson proposed the tale of Robin Hood, which was given a favorable reception by Walker. Upon returning to the studio, Ken pitched the idea during a story meeting on the Aristocats. In the follow-up meeting with Wolfgang Reiselman, Bill Anderson, and Larry Clements, Ken was assigned a job to begin exploratory animal character drawings. In developing the characters, Anderson recycled some of his and Mark Davis's old ideas from Reynard the Fox and Chanticleer. He created the characters as anthropomorphic animals making the late character Robin Hood a fox like Reynard, and the narrating minstrel, Alan Dale, designed as Chanticleer once had been. Stay tuned, in part two we will explore the film's character development further, the chosen voice actors to portray them, along with studying some of the animation process. Thank you for listening. If you would like to watch Robin Hood, for yourself before part two of the series. It is available on iTunes, YouTube, Amazon Prime, Google Play, Disney Plus, and of course, DVD. If you enjoyed this type of 50th anniversary content, please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. The Disney Scrapbook will be producing other 50th anniversary content throughout the year that will include reviews of Disney films, LPs, books, and FIFA content. Thanks everybody for watching. See you again soon. TTFN, and for now.